Hello, and welcome to the Producers Guild conversation with the creative team behind the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We'd like to thank our friends at Disney and Marvel Studios for making this event possible. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator today, Richard Newby. Richard is an author and pop culture journalist from Columbus, Ohio, covering film, television, comic books, and horror. He is a contributor for The Hollywood Reporter, and his work has also appeared in The New York Times and Pangoria. He is a recent recipient of the National Arts and Entertainment Journalism Award for his essay, Protest Backlash and the Failings of a Superhero Culture. Welcome, Richard. Welcome, panelists. And please, Richard, take it away. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, first off, congratulations on the, on the series again. Uh, such a such a brilliant brilliant show. Uh, Kari and Malcolm, I've spoken to you both before. Uh, congratulations again, uh, Kevin, Zoe, Nate. Congratulations to you all. Uh, you know, this series has really felt like a cultural event. You know, Sam Wilson taking over the the mantle of Captain America, I think, has been something of a of a watershed moment. Um, you know, giving people a black hero, I think, when it really feels like we need it. Um, you know, have any of you really had the opportunity to to soak in uh, what a moment this is yet? It's been for me, it's been um, kind of beyond words. You know, we make uh, you know, I make an effort to stay connected to where I came from and everything and to see how it's resonating with the folks I came up with um, is, you know, it, it, it's really, really I'm speechless. I'm, I'm often speechless. And what I'm most proud of, I think, is that all the discussions we had in the writer's room about what we wanted these stories to embody and to speak on maybe indirectly and thematically everyone it's not just people like you who are catching it and people all the way down to just you know regular regular fans and regular working folk are, are catching it all so it, it's i really don't have a word for it but it's been a very special special experience uh, agreed ditto i also have to add i think um, from the get-go, from the moment that I got a telephone call to come and uh, present, um, you know, my pitch uh, to be involved, I knew that this was going to be the most, for me, and I think I'm speaking for all of us, that it was going to be really one of the most important projects of this century. I'm curious about the, the development of this series. You know, Sam was teed up to take on the mantle of Captain America at the end of Avengers Endgame. Uh, how early did you guys know that that was the, that was the plan? Um, the plan to do a show or the plan to pass him, give the him- plan The plan to pass the, the shield on to, to Sam. It was, pretty, it was pretty early. I mean, taking our cues as we always do from the, uh, from the comics, you know, Bucky had, had taken in the comics for a short time and Sam had as well. And it did seem that um, that uh, that was the that was the smart move was to give it to Sam, was to have to have uh, Steve, old man Steve there at the end, pass it to him. Uh, the idea for a show came about soon after that when Bob Iger said he would like Marvel Studios to start uh, working on shows for the upcoming streaming service for Disney. And that's really where we got to say it is an infinitely more complex decision personally for Sam to take that mantle than simply being handed a prop by somebody. Um, and that's where uh, where it became sort of handed over to Zoe and Nate to uh, to start building a team. I know you guys uh, at Marvel are constantly looking back to the, the source material in the comics. So when Sam became Captain America in the comics in 2015, did any of you have any inkling at the time that the MCU would also be headed that way. Uh, Nate, you want to speak to that? I, I mean, I think the answer is yeah. The short answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, I think you. We always take inspiration from what we see. We we're not always consulted on those decisions. So sometimes it's just a happy accident when something like that happens, and you go, "Oh wow!" Like we we have this great actor who's already done so well for us in our films, uh, even if it's just with what we're shooting on the day. 
to know that that then becomes a North Star you can drive to is really exciting, right? Uh, and then the job is how do you drive there in a way that feels organic and that you that you buy? Because to Kevin's point, it's not just about handing him the prop of the shield. I think if it was just that, frankly, audiences wouldn't care. It's about really interrogating what that means for Sam to 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 get that and, and have to reconcile what that could mean for him if he decides to take on that mantle. I think that's where Malcolm and Kari really found all the nuance that, that hopefully made the show resonate for people. You know, I, I think that Marvel Studios always does such an excellent job of, you know, picking creators who you might not expect to take on these stories. Uh, you know, it's not always people who have specifically worked in the genre space. So what was it about Kari and Malcolm that made them the people, you know, to, to guide the show? Funny, Anthony has the same question. <laughs> yeah, this is a good question. Yeah, that was <laughs> <laughs> we did the, the big screening the other night and um, at the Rose Bowl, and Anthony came on and he said, "So, what made you think you guys were the right guys for this?" <laughs> anyway, I'm interested to hear. <laughs> no, like I think it it always comes from a place of who is tackling the characters in a way that feels interesting and new and nuanced. You know, it's not so much about people who've come from the action space, although that can be helpful and additive. You know, Malcolm came in with an extreme amount of knowledge on TV and how to break long form story. And also just in his pitch, understood these characters and had takes on them that felt nuanced and made them human. Uh, Cause that was the opportunity we had with six hours is you can have all the scenes that would often get cut from our, our films. So he came in already excited about those scenes. Yeah, the action is gonna be great and it's gonna be fun. And he came in with a sensibility about, you know, buddy cop narratives and, you know, sort of that kind of uh, conflicted partners in action together. But what really drew us to him was his take on these guys as humans, as people, and Kari as well. So then on that side of it, for, for Kari, you know, we, we were drawn to her grounded way of telling stories, that every time she tells a story, she not only in her filmmaking visual style, but in the way she captures the characters' minds, it's always an, an attempt to add layers to them, even if they're people that are not of our world, that are a bit inaccessible at the front. Uh, Anthony Mackey said recently that, you know, he was a little hesitant uh, when he was first approached about the, the series. He had some, some fears and some concerns. Uh, did he have any conversations with any of you about those, about those concerns? And did you guys have to, you know, assuage those fears in any way? Well, I, 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 I have a distinct memory sitting with uh, Nate and Lou Esposito in Lou's office where we were like, and we're going to do a show. And he, and he is a great actor, but you could see his poker face was failing him a little bit there. Uh, and, and the truth is, anytime anybody signs up to do anything with us, um, we take that as a huge um, vote of trust and we need to earn that trust. So from that moment forward, I knew, look, you know, he's, he's nervous about it. We have to make a great show no matter what but we particularly have to make a great show because he's agreeing to do this even with his reservations. And I just, you always use that as uh, as um, fuel to uh, to try to go above and beyond. Yeah. Did any of you have any, any fears going into this? I think of course you do. I mean, especially at Marvel, we'd made films that had worked and had really reached people, but we'd never done six hours of any of anything uh, and that's a little bit of a different ball game you know it's a little bit like we were building the best race cars in the world and then we had to build a boat like you 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 like to think your expertise in one area translates to another but that's not necessarily the truth but again with partners like malcolm and kari who had navigated the television space before who could help us sort of hone in the things that we thought might work uh, uh for the story of, of sam and and uh and bucky and figuring out how to do that over six hours, it, it was a task, but it was, it was, we're learning, you know, we're learning. And I think Malcolm and Kari helped to get us there. I, what I really appreciated about the process was it's a blend of, um, because like you've been saying, um, you guys make movies. And I don't think I've ever thought of my work as anything other than a movie, even though I've been doing, you know, lots of hours of it and, know what the sort of time and pace of what that can be. What I really appreciated was that that sensibility was applied to, because I think people have a tendency to diminish television in some way in their head. They go, oh, it's television, so therefore it is this. 
and there was never that um, uh, that box. And so it meant that we were making a movie, and that was the agreement. And that translated through the entire process, through the crew, through uh, I think also to to the case of Anthony and Sebastian, where they felt the entire process was a familiar space. So therefore, they got comfortable. And the bar was that. The bar was, you know, a movie. So that I think um, is part of the whole success, not only of the show itself, because you can see that authorship of everybody involved uh, at that level. But I think it also is testimony to um, uh, how to go forward with these big projects. Uh, I, I will use this template and refer to it often. As the, uh, you know, the, the fact that these are six hour stories, you know, compared to the, the two hour and 20 minute movies, has that, you know, changed any of your perspectives on, on the movies at all? You know, the fact that you have this extra time to kind of dig into these characters who don't always get as much spotlight as they do in the series, you know, has that kind of changed the approach to the films at all? Uh, I don't know. Nate, I, I, I don't think so, actually. I think it's, um, we just revel in the extra time when we have it on the Disney Plus series. Yeah, I think to Zoe's point, if anything, you, you, you just value what these shows are able to do from a character standpoint, because you have the time. Because you can go home with Sam to Louisiana and bring that world to life and thus inform his character in a way that in a film, I don't know that we would have had time for. Uh, I think, both mediums are amazing and valid and can do such such great things, but I do think there was a privilege in making these shows and being able to take the time finally uh, uh, and and allow our performers to perform because they're so talented. You know, uh, Sebastian and Anthony Mackey and, and Adaporo and and Carl Lumley and our cast from top to bottom was so great that because we had time to do these great dramatic scenes that they got to inhabit, uh, uh, we got to see different colors from them that we don't always get to see. Yeah, you know, as much as I love the the action and the world building, some of my favorite aspects of this series, you know, were those parts where Sam was talking to his sister when he was in Louisiana, you know, when we get to meet his family. Uh, and to me, you know, that really, I think, embodied what Stan Lee and Jack Kirby did, you know, with Marvel Comics is that these are stories about people. Um, and I think, you know, with this series in particular, there's, you know, not any clear cut you know, villain story. You know, these are all complicated characters who do, you know, good things and bad things. Um, but I'm curious about the challenges of that, of crafting the superhero story in which you don't have, you know, any villain that you're able to distinguish and, you know, say, here are the clear dividing lines. It, it I mean, for us, it, as that started to come into focus and we were starting to, the more we as a creative group started to really be able to advocate for the, for the position of these villains. Like, you know, I think more, it, the more that bar rose and we really, really tried hard to walk away from, and from a project where we could say there are no real villains in that I think you know, the difference, Marvel does a really good job of like making someone like Thanos well-rounded and giving him a rationale for what he's doing, right? But the difference between what Thanos is doing and what the Flag Smashers or even Zemo or John Walker are doing is that you can't really, uh, ultimately you can't sign off on, I'm gonna exterminate half of living everything right that's just there's no way anyone can sign off on that you, you can rationalize it but you can't sign off on it we the, the the discussions we had in the writer's room about why carly was doing what she was doing or what john walker was going through or like think about how often zemo never lets anybody off the hook about what they did to his country and his family like and that's the real shit do you have people transgressions don't go away so anyway um, um, I, I was really, really proud of how we all sort of were able to dial in on this. And I got emails from people who, you know, other filmmakers saying, please redeem Carly, please don't turn her into a bad guy. You know what I'm saying? And, and that was really satisfying. 
I, you know, someone just emailed me um, today, actually, and said they had waited uh, to watch it because their family, this has been another really wonderful, um, but unexpected, uh, you know, derivative of it, of it all is the family experience. And uh, he said, he's a very well-known writer. And he said, you know, I, because kids went back to school and this and that, we waited till we could all be together in our schedules. So we then binged it this, this last weekend. And he was very effusive. He said, you know, my 16 year old daughter wept uh, when uh, Lamar was killed. And he said, you know, to be moved like that is really special. Um, and when uh, Carly died, same thing, you know, it was very, very, um, it was riveting for the family together as a group. And I've had many people say, yes, we, and it was partly the COVID of it, I suppose, but I, the Friday night of, yes, we get to watch another, another episode of this uh, wonderful story as a family experience, which opened up all kinds of conversation, which was the goal. Because I think not only were we looking um, to open up the slippery slopes of what these characters and people who, who we felt resonated um, as really very relevant to what we see in the headlines, but um, I think also uh, we opened up, we didn't want to tie it all up in a nice neat bow. Mm -hmm. And that's why the brilliance of um, Malcolm's speech at the end, the writing about you can do better you can, it opened doors, it didn't close them. So for the first time we had a, a situation where a, uh, a hero comes in and says, uh, okay, this is just the beginning of the conversation as compared to you know, locking it all up and saying, okay, we put the villain in jail, all good, let's go. And that I think is a big turning point for, for going forward in this kind of story where you can do that in a completely elegant way. I'm curious, you know, in, in terms of the, the conception of the series, uh, are there certain characters that you know, you know, you want to use beforehand outside of Sam and Bucky, of course, but how much of that is, you know, what the writers are bringing to the table and how much of it is, you know, you guys as a studio wanting to use these characters because you know that it's setting up things further down the line? Uh, well, there are two examples that come to my uh, head, which is Sharon Carter, who we hadn't seen in a while in the movies, we wanted to catch up with, and 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 Emily Van Camp's a great actress. We wanted to see see more of her and and uh, see what she's been up to since we'd last seen her in Civil War. And another one that initially was not uh, uh, in my mind to be in the series, but Malcolm brought to the table was Isaiah Bradley. I was afraid Isaiah Bradley's story is so all encompassing and so big that that uh, we wouldn't be able to do it justice by just having him appear in what initially I thought, well, would just be a cameo. Malcolm really, really fought to, to include him and he's, and he's in some ways the heart and soul of the show now. Uh, so that, that's too. Zoe, I'm sure there are many other examples. Yeah, you know, I think because we were telling a story about the shield and building a world in which there were no easy answers, everything was complicated post blip. So the shield is also complicated. The legacy of the shield is complicated. John Walker is a character we felt had to be a part of this story. Uh, it, you know, varied in what way he came into the story and how he operated. But at the end of the day, I think we kind of found a place for him where he was someone you love to hate, but you you hate that you sympathize, but you, you love that he's doing it the wrong way. But you, you know that you sort of are torn between all these emotions around him, which really brought to the surface a lot of the conflict around the history of the Shield that Sam was dealing with. Um, so John Walker was a character, I think, in our minds was a must have if we were going to tell a story about, you know, the shields passing from one hand to another. Yeah, and I think to, to Zoe's point, it, it, very rarely have we ever said include this character because we want to set something up. It's usually just because we we're trying to tell the best story possible. And if we get to tell more stories with a specific character later, that's usually an unexpected consequence. But it's really like what's gonna make this, this one piece of storytelling the best? And if that's John Walker, it's John Walker. If it's not, it's not. But it's, it's not because we have an agenda beyond the show. It's just what's gonna make the show the best. I was gonna reemphasize that. Like, I, I think one of the things I have seen doing press or talking to people is there is a real assumption, misconception of how Marvel comes to the decisions and and it really is, it seems to me anyway, my, my limited experience there, 
is wholly about being organic and intuitive about storytelling. It's never, you never hear words like exploit or brand or, you know what I'm saying? It's, it, they really, really do uh, uh, just want to make each project the best it can be. And um, I think there's a lot of bias because of the kind of numbers the movies and stuff do, there's a lot of unfounded bias in what the process is to uh, make these things. Yet the love from the fans should be an indicator that something very, very right and creative is happening, you know, behind those, uh, those doors that they don't let me through anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they were worried you were going to steal one of the costumes. That's <laughs> And when you go yeah. to Marvel, they have these great, they, they, these, I mean, I was taking selfies with the first, my, first, uh, my first journey down that hallway. And there's these great, all the co great costumes. And, um, you know, you, of course you're touching them. And I, I, pick, I, I didn't pick up the hammer. That's the, my one big regret. <laughs> it says, pick up the hammer if you dare. And I was like, oh, should I? And then there's all these cameras, right? I'm going to get nailed if I pick up that hammer. So I stared at the hammer for like 10 minutes. All right, I won't pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I do want to touch on uh, Isaiah Bradley a little more um, because I think, you know, using him in the series was such an interesting and, and powerful move. And, you know, I, I grew up with Truth, you know, Robert Morales and Kyle Baker's graphic novel. And that's actually, you know, how I learned about this, the Tuskegee experiments. You know, and I remember what a major, you know, and controversial story that was. So I'm curious, you know, when you're, when you're bringing him into the MCU, you know, were there any concerns about how far you could actually push it? Because, I mean, that story is incredibly dark. And I was honestly surprised you know, that you guys were able to do it justice and really, you know, bring the gravity and the weight of his story into the MCU? I, I was definitely surprised. I kept thinking I was going to get a tap saying, hey, dude, calm down. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, and again, it is that's based on my own misconceptions on how Marvel's working, because you show up sort of in a defensive posture you know, be, just because it's such a big, loud platform. And um, the whole time I remembered like, you know, just thinking to myself, talking to my wife, which they didn't know I was doing, but yes, I was, they should do the whole series. <laughs> um, but that, that run in the series because of reading the books was so exciting to me. And I was so sure that this, would like like Kevin said this would be the soul of the project and yeah I, I for sure thought we would get the tap and then even watching like some of the stuff Kari did with Walker afterwards with the shield you can't believe it like you see the cuts and you're and you're and it's like it is what needed to happen in the story but you you your first time up to bat at Marvel maybe you show up with some of the same biases that sort of people who write about Marvel, present company excluded, have. Um, it's a long way to answer to say yes. I thought for sure they were gonna yank, hit me with the uh, the Apollo theater that that that, that cane that yanks you off the stage. <laughs> you afraid Sandman was coming? I thought the Sandman was coming. <laughs> I, I mean, the uh, only concern, Richard, the only concern as I'd said before was uh, on my end was not being able to do it justice was to was to uh uh that we would be falling into another marvel a uh, bias which is just cram in as many characters as possible let's keep adding more characters that'll be cool um i didn't want to do that uh, to isaiah if we couldn't actually do it justice and malcolm kept uh kept um uh uh really believing in it and fighting for it and clearly delivered yes the soul of the the soul of the show through isaiah you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about his inclusion is that in terms of the, the timeline of the MCU, it raises a lot of interesting questions, you know, about Thunderbolt Ross's involvement in recreating the super soldier serum, Howard Starks, you know, fans are already theorizing, you know, who knew about Isaiah and who didn't. So, you know, when you have a, a writer, you know, with such a creative drive who's bringing in these characters that you didn't expect, you know, how does that 
kind of shake up your notions of, of what's been established or kind of where you think these stories might go? Well, I mean, that that's sort of the entire creative history of the MCU is individual voices coming in, adding adding their their storyline, their additional toy to the to the toy box. And then uh, other artists and writers can take that and utilize it. So it very much the importance of Isaiah was how it served this series. The fun now for us is how we can play with Isaiah, both in the future of the MCU and, as you rightfully uh, point out, what that means to the history, in particular, the super soldier program within the MCU. Uh, Nate, you know, I know that I've, I've heard you talk about Black Panther, you know, quite a bit in your involvement in that. And I mean, that was such a, you know, monumental film for, you know, for, it was for all audiences, but for Black audiences in particular. But I think, you know, with Sam Wilson, you know, we have an African-American character who I think, you know, is having a different experience because, you know, he's not living in an isolated society. Um, so I'm just curious about how much input you had in kind of creating those ties between Sam's rise as Captain America and also, you know, referring back to the motherland, to Wakanda and his technology. Yeah, look, it's interesting because I do think you put your finger on it. it T'Challa's experience as a leader and, a, and as a hero is different than Sam's just because he comes from a, a nation that is uh, has autonomy and, and that has only ever been sovereign and, and under its own power. And Sam's coming from a very different history being African-American and, and growing up in the States. So I, I think that rise is 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 unique and makes the character stand apart from Wakanda. I think the notion of tying the new suit to Wakanda is sort of fun. It's it's both fun storytelling from what publishing established decades before, which is cool, but also is a good nod to tie these two characters together even, even spiritually, uh, uh, because I think Sam can stand for something for a group of people that even past Black Panther didn't quite feel seen because you know, to Charles Wakandan, that's a that's a different thing, uh, and I think it's easy to conflate the two, but really they're they're much different characters. Uh, Kari, you know, I'm, I'm curious about your experience directing uh, the action in the series because I think it's some of the best of the MCU. Uh, and you know, I've I've seen some of your previous work, but I don't exactly you know associate you with action directing. So, was there any learning curve for you in terms of you know hitting those high expectations that that fans look for in the in the Marvel features? Uh, well, I've actually done quite a bit of action, so I wasn't I didn't feel out of my element. What I hadn't done was um, the the specific kind of choreography with the the for the super soldier of it, which requires um, a very particular kind of, um, not only equipment, but um, layered uh, um, process, I suppose. Because it not only is it, it has to be, uh, the entire scene has to be um, choreographed to the location. Sometimes we're back and forth, whether we have the location first or we're doing the fight first. And so um, what I hope I brought to the table, and thank you for the very nice compliment because I feel like the bar, uh, particularly in that, was very, very high. Uh, wanted to bring character to each of the sequences, and each one of them wanted to have its own, um, I want to say, look, feel, and difference. Plus, we took all of the, so if there's, I don't know, let's call it 10 action sequences, I looked at that as one complete story. Uh, for the characters, where they were starting, where they where they were going to end, because it was all baked into the idea of where they were in particular in each, not only episode, but where they were in the story. So it had to relate to that. So we then, so we looked at the overall story, then carved it up, and then gave each one of them a particular character and signature. So um, <laughs> the only one that I regret terribly, in the sense that it was very complicated to pull off was the truck tops. I mean, forever we were, we hmm. were joking about the truck tops and it looks fantastic. Uh, but from the beginning there was Zoe and I with little you know, trucks and tops and talking, <laughs> getting our guys to try and figure out how to you know, put people on moving trucks, which we did. Um, and so, and then we, you know, we had one that we called the horror sequence, the horror, uh, because we, you know, we went into a place that was kind of haunted and spooky. And uh, then we had the epic battle at the end that had to be a particularly um, uh, not only very very um, emotionally charged 
because it came right after um, uh, John Walker had killed um, a flag smasher very publicly. So anyway, each one of them had its own really particular uh, emotional, you know, through line. And I think that's where it was really exhilarating because they were stories. So it just added to the storytelling. And um, I'd like to think the other part to it that we all focused on was grounding it as much as possible. So it, and I think that's the difference. We were allowed to do that because of the nature of the story. We were not in another worldly place. We were in, you know, within our, our uh, world. So it had to have a grounded sense to it. And I wanted it also to have perspective. So each character, and that was part of the, the emotional journey of it. So we were, I was trying constantly to choose a perspective to be in, even if we switch perspectives during that, whether it's the fight or, or chase or whatever, I, I was still trying to make a choice. Uh, Zoe, you know, I'm curious, you know, the, the, the production happened and there are all sorts of issues with the, the pandemic and the earthquakes. So I'm just curious about how, you know, you manage that and how your responsibilities kind of shifted with these unprecedented events that took place during production. Yeah, you know, it, it at times felt like every possible curveball was being thrown our way. Uh, but it really is a credit. <laughs> it really is a credit to uh, the group. It, it is a team effort across the board, um, you know, all the way up to people within Disney, you know, working on health and safety, all the way down to, you know, our props department, our, you know, locations team moving locations at the last minute and you know, um, our ADs, you know, fixing the schedule when it needed to be fixed. Like it, it was just every single person was impacted by it, but we were so lucky to have the best in the business doing what they do best. Uh, and morale wise, we had amazing cast members who would come to set with great energy and positivity and make everyone feel like, you know, we're still doing what we love to do, even if it was in the midst of trying circumstances. Um, and at the end of the day, I think we all just love getting to make these stories. So whatever it took, we were going to get it done. You know, I think it's, it's, it's hard to, to watch this series and not think about the events uh, of the past year, you know, specifically in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, in terms of issues with policing and the treatment of, of veterans. Um, you know, I, I'm curious how much of that, you know, kind of impacted or maybe shifted things during production. You know, you're, you're making this project while you know, these monumental changes are happening in this, in this country. You know, how much were you able to kind of react to that and pull some of those things into the series? And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think to some degree what, what's, what's interesting and sad is those issues aren't new. So the show was speaking to an experience that has been happening for a long time. It just happens that George Floyd was plopped in the middle of our shoot, but there's a George Floyd uh, way too often. So I think the stuff that Malcolm and Kari were responding to, even from a material standpoint, wasn't ripped from the headlines. It's it's the reality of being black in America, and 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 thus I think feels prescient when really the sad truth is it's just reality. You know? Yeah, I agree. We were dialed in. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it was it was all there for the taking. I think, you know, it, just to repeat what Nate's saying is these were the, the discussion is just a steady escalation of a conversation that hasn't been get, have, being had. And so when we dialed in on it, since no one else is really having this discussion, it looks like we're being super, super prescient. But man, these are just these are just the experiences and a lot of shit you can see coming from a mile away, you know what I'm saying? Because if you're black, you know, you have a very, very specific uh, take on the DNA of this nation. I, we also, we were well, as they're saying, we were well into the story. We didn't, the story didn't change. Scenes didn't change. We were already, we'd, we'd shot most of, most of the show. I think what it allowed us to do is um, or not allowed. I mean, I think it just, we sharpened our pencil perhaps and we went in and, and you know, made sure that we were um, uh, leaving no stone unturned. But we, um, it just sort of made us realize we were kind of a bit taken aback with how far, you know, how, how the world was reflecting art in that time. And that, so it just underscored 
how long overdue this conversation was in the in the forum that we were in. So it just made us all, you know, very proud. You know, I, I think Marvel has always been situated within uh, current political events, you know, even going back to, to Iron Man. Um, but I think that with the, the greater attention to inclusivity, especially, you know, what we've seen with phase four and going forward, I think that we're getting a lot of new interesting voices uh, and getting a lot of different perspectives now that we didn't necessarily see before. So I'm curious about how that has kind of changed uh, Marvel Studios storytelling approach. Uh, I think it's made it better. I think it's made it more uh, creative. And I think you're right. I think the comics have always um, attempted that in its own way, uh, in its own time. Um, and and what what we've been able to do with the with the creators you see on this on this call and in all of our projects is bring, uh, you know, the truth is, you know, we've been doing this now for for, you know, 12, 13, 14 years. Um, 20 plus movies, you know, we're on our fifth, sixth, seventh series now. And uh, we wouldn't have made it anywhere near uh, that far if we didn't have unique storytellers telling unique stories from a unique perspective. You know, going forward, now that we have Sam Wilson as Captain America, you know, he won't always appear in a six episode series. So I'm curious about making sure that you know, the, the issues and concerns that have been introduced in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, his specific insight and the lessons that he's learned from, you know, both Isaiah and Steve and even Bucky, you know, how do you make sure that that, you know, stays in the forefront as we continue to see his journey uh, in the movies? Uh, I mean, I think uh, when you see Sam next, uh, I think he will very much be informed by what's happened. I, I think it would be disingenuous for us as storytellers to drop the ball on that you know as to how and when that happens who's to say but uh, you know he will be uh, changed forever by the experiences he had in this in the show which i think is for the better of the character and and is just the truth uh you know another thing that i wanted to, to bring up is the dynamic between sam and bucky i mean it's clear that anthony mackie and sebastian stan really like each other off screen and i think that you know, really plays to their relationship on screen as well. Um, so I, you know, I think that Sam becoming Captain America is equal parts, you know, Bucky's journey as well. So I'm curious about, you know, how their relationship and how that dynamic will continue. Do you guys see Bucky as being as integral a part as this Captain America story, you know, as Sam is? Uh, no, well, I think Bucky is integral to the MCU in the way Sam is. I don't know that he's as integral to the Captain America story. I think he's integral to the, to the James Buchanan Barnes story. And that's really what we look forward to diving into in the future even, uh, even more. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for, for taking the time to speak with me today. Uh, again, I, I truly love the series. Um, you know, I, I've watched it several times now. Um, you know, I, I think it's one of the best things of the of the MCU, and I I say that as a huge fan of the MCU. You know, Iron Man in two thousand eight was my first midnight movie experience in high school. Uh, you know, I started my journalism career at THR with Black Panther. Uh, so you know, Marvel Studios films have been very important to me, um, and the Falcon and the Winter Soldier is one of my favorite projects so far. So congratulations uh, to all of you again, and thank you for for bringing all of your your insights to this. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks for doing this, Richard. Come thank ahead. you. Yeah. Making it. I can tell you that we really love making it. So thank you for loving it back. <laughs>